So I'm the penetrator. Games back. Uh, we so we just presented uh, on the main stage a framework for interfacing with the vehicular ad hoc network. Uh, rather for oh, true. I'm sure, we get one of these guys. Um, we just presented a framework built on the mainline Linux kernel for interfacing with connected vehicles. Um, so this concept of V to V, V to X, uh, using, uh, by, by making modifications to the drivers for uh, cheap, accessible, consumer off-the-shelf hardware such that you can do this now with a $20 Wi-Fi card rather than a $5,000 DSRC radio. Um, I'm going to jump around in the slides here a little bit more. Um, we're going to skip a lot of the sort of high level theoretical things. Um, the concept of V to X, just to reiterate a little bit for those of you who weren't at the talk, um, the rapid high throughput exchange of inf safety information between participants of this vehicular ad hoc network to enable um, you know, enhanced safety and behavioral optimization functions within a highly dense traffic environment. So what this means is cars and infrastructure points are exchanging um, state information constantly in order to optimize things like traffic flow. Um, there you go. Sure. <coughs> so, um, what was that? Okay, so uh, some of the critical features or aspects of this stuff is to, um, you know, I mean, f first and foremost, it's safety to actually allow the cars to um, provide information to each other that they can't get through the normal sensors. So, you know, you can't see inside the car, you can't see inside the engine, and the, you know, the ECUs and all that stuff. So they have to encode that into, you know, over-the-air radio message so that other cars in the vicinity can actually decode it and get an understanding of where the network status is and kind of route their traffic around that and, uh, you know, coordinate. So, you know, it has major impacts on uh, the, on every aspect of the transportation network and really this reaches out into most every aspect of society as we know it. The transportation infrastructure and uh, especially the connected transportation infrastructure will touch uh, all the other sectors of critical infrastructure systems from uh, energy and power distribution to financial to medical, um, et cetera. So the impact of having these connected vehicle technologies is that you enable s unprecedented levels of safety functions that are simply not possible with the sensor networks on board one specific platform. Um, it has, let's see, we're going to skip around a little bit. Um, there are already some deployed technologies using V to X, so these are rolling out already in commercial automobiles for the last couple of years, like cooperative adapt cruise control. Um, you see a little picture of here where the members of the network um, ex you know, exchange state information and, and, and do some, some math in order to uh, you know, reduce the amount of, amount of stress and, and braking um, and to really smooth out the behavioral flow. Um, of these vehicles, uh, we have you know collision avoidance, um, advanced driver assistance, uh, automated ticketing, is, and and tolling is sort of to be implemented almost unquestionably in the future. Um, this we might not like so much, but it is unavoidable. Um, so you want to take this one? Sure. <clears throat> so our uh, our approach to kind of developing these things is to. Uh, create an open source software solution that allows you to use um, commodity hardware, particularly, you know, specifically the Atheros 9K chipset um, on Linux to actually do this 5.8 to 5.9 gigahertz transmission in OCB mode and, you know, do V to V um, to allow people, to allow anyone to develop their own systems to test, to validate, and to kind of further development of the V to V systems and vehicular ad hoc networks in general. Um, so that the, the future standards can build upon, you know, the cooperative uh, data collection that anyone can, you know, buy into essentially. Uh, so I have a particular taste for this because I spent about two years um, before I brought him on, it was one year, uh, digging around the depths, the soulless chasm that is Linux kernel, trying to understand the uh, attempts at integration so far. And what we come to realize is that pretty much every group that has 
gone out to develop uh, an open source framework for doing V2V has failed, has orphaned the project partway through or gone closed source and produced an incomplete uh, and now obsolete implementation that is being considered for deployment. Uh, it's simply unacceptable. So what we've done is modify the mainline Linux kernel and you know, set of standard Linux networking drivers that enable you to interface with VANet using a $20 Wi-Fi card and any computer that runs Linux. Um, so, right, um, lessons learned, everybody sucks, sharing is caring except for herpes, um, standards committees are, um, need some serious assistance developing these kinds of um, you know, highly complex safety systems that require the, the participation of the security community. Uh, hence, this goes back to motivation for developing this framework, giving every member of the security community, every person here and worldwide, the ability to sit down and start developing applications and understanding fundamentally without you know, doing an analysis of the protocols and, and the standards. Um, what? I got a question. Uh, I'm, I'm probably, is, is it a really good question? Because otherwise, I, I'm, yeah, can it wait? Or, or if it's a really good question, I mean, yeah, come on up. Yes. Well, because the standards communities aren't really being engaged by uh, by a whole lot of the security community. I mean, I know the so I know those that were, in fact were part of the committee for um, or on the distribution that's developing the security layer. Um, very much incomplete, uh, very much lacking. In fact, so so right, V2V systems are being deployed without any existence of a functional 16092 layer. That to me says that these people need some help developing them, right? Um, and that's and that's okay. Well, the, the, the standard is, is incomplete and still under revision as it is today. Um, so, I mean, uh, you know, one, one of the examples, one of the examples in 69.2 that raised some concern for me was the actual um, generation of certificates, right? I think that they were supposed to be refreshed every day, right? I mean, that, that was the current, that was the scheme, I believe, no? We don't need to argue with <laughs> it. Um, Uh, so, I mean, no. But, but look, look let's, let's talk about this after we got about 20 minutes left. Um, I'd be happy to have this discussion with you and we, and we can come over some of the distributions of the, of the committee. Um, I'm just wondering because you put all this information and they're just simply not necessarily true. So, uh, <laughs> the. Hey, 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 check your privilege. So the, we're going to do a stack overview, right? We, we go from the physical layer, 802.11p. Um, actually, I think we'll go back a couple, a couple of years. Uh, so the physical layer is comprised by, and, and the Mac layer by IEEE 802.11p, the management plane uh, by IEEE 16.09, and the application layer by SE J2735. So uh, just to go over these quickly, 802.11p, um, so multicast, uh, uh, ad hoc mesh networking mode that specifies no use of authentication, encryption, or association. Um, over 5.8 to 5.9 gigahertz ITS bands, ITS intelligent transportation systems. They use 5 and 10 megahertz with subcarriers within these channels um, and this modulation scheme called OFDM, which is a standard, uh, you know, standard uh, Wi-Fi modulation scheme. Okay. So all right, moving on to 1609. So we have the definitions for the uh, security services in 02 or in point two, um, the networking services and the message, you know, the sort of encoding dictionaries in point three. Point four is the multi-channel operation, and uh, point twelve, I believe, is the identifier allocations for uh, provider service IDs, which are kind of you know, unique strings issued by IEEE to identify particular service types. All right. Yep. 
And then J27, J2735 is the application layer um, grammar message dictionary that specifies the safety messages that will be used um, you know, in interoperable V2V systems. So basic safety message is the, the one that has been most developed so far. Um, uh, messages, that, messages that will be continuously transmitted at periodic intervals between all members of the VA net that it includes state information, things like the dimensionality, uh, the heading, location of the car, such that you can perform you know, behavioral optimization, dispatch, reactionary, um, uh, reactionary actions to the vehicle bus to augment the behavior. Um, so they have been under development since 2005-2006. Uh, the uh, you know, NHTSA has been drafting documentation, I think, since about 2004 on this. There's been a lot of talk. There's been many major overhauls to the standards without really, uh, without a deployment of a fully complete and compliant implementation. Still today. Um, so the development is very much still in flux. Uh, major All right, so um, some major changes to the standards. Uh, the actual message uh, encodings um, have encountered some slight modifications, but significant enough that the actual parsers wouldn't work between, um, you know, going from, I believe, WS would be you know, one and two to th three, I believe. Uh, and the uh, message dictionaries in J2735 have changed dramatically uh, in the actual entire scheme. The encoding scheme has changed, so they're completely incompatible. Um, Originally using this thing called dir and then to bur and then to upur, so three completely different, semi-related but, but incompatible encoding formats that change sequentially through each major revision of the standard. So you have ASN1 specifications that are entirely incompatible, and in fact the most recent one that was published doesn't actually compile and also uses uh, type systems that are non-standard in ASN1 processing utilities. Um, so basically, I even went so far as to buy the spec, which is something I, I try to, I try to never do. And 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 what do you know? It doesn't actually compile, and you can't actually use it or parse it. Um, so what we did is is take this this cobble work that uh, of, of 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 a broken standard and and implement some of it in in C. To, so that it's, it's digestible um, and functional, and, and we'll show that in a little bit here. Um, you know, that we, there's there's some question in our heads about um, about the development of the standards. So there's been a lot of um, ambiguity that's being introduced. Uh, there's you know things like the message CRCs, the verification codes, were removed in the most recent revision of J2735 from the roadside alerts from the emergency vehicle alerts. Um, the rest were the same, but you take out the error checking code. Uh, it's kind of weird, right? Um, after 15 years of reservation for these, for the ITS bands for use in intelligent transportation systems, now suddenly they're up for sale to the, uh, to the telecom, uh, talking about being used for LTE. Um, and we just described the, the overhauls of the ASN1 into a non-standard format. Um, and then, furthermore, there's just a, there's a lot of ambiguity that existed previously in the standards. Um, she'll talk about subtleties. Oh yeah, sure. Um, so, I mean, these are these aren't uh, necessarily design flaws. These are just uh, issues that can potentially lead to some implementation fuzziness. Uh, there, um, the the way that uh, the information elements are packed, their variable length, and the specification in a couple of places, you know, wastes uh, like a byte to, um, encoding the length, and in other places there is actually a bit of ambiguity as to whether or not there should even be a byte there to begin with, as to whether you know indicating whether a certain block would be there or not, uh, and that just it, it leads to some issues that could go further down in the pipeline, not in the standards. Eh, not on the standards level, but on the level of implementation where you could have someone develop buggy implementations that cause issues and, you know, that's undesirable, definitely. Um. Um, so I want to get into the code here since we're, since we're pretty short on time uh, and just went over a lot of this. Uh, but this is, this is important real quick. I mean, big attack surfaces, so right, the, the nature of the VA net is that it's accessible from a single endpoint. And from one compromising one endpoint, you can propagate a message over the entire network in this distributed uh, mesh networking fashion such that you can, say, uh, store information on a vehicle that does not get distributed until it goes, uh, say, across like a certain border, um, and, and you can propagate it further. You, you know, c within the the 
you know, still being compatible with the standards. So not only, it's not just malformed DSRC messages, it's compliant, compatible DSRC messages that you can store, um, you know, deliverables in and propagate at an arbitrary point throughout the entire network. Um, you can perform privilege escalation in the public key infrastructure to hijack, uh, say, something like an emergency vehicles certificate, um, you know, cause cars to move out of the road or, you know, execute something like the platooning service to disable vehicles. Um, and, and, you know, probably the most obvious one maybe we should have started with is it acts as an entry point to isolated systems. So the DSRC radio is hooked into the uh, vehicle control bus and, right, so if you can send reactionary actions based on, you know, proximal network activity, that means that you can also send malicious actions based on your desires, right? Um, so there's, there's active and passive adversaries. Um, can, can you wait ten minutes? Pretty please. Pretty please. Uh, so I, I've spent two years, hey, check your privilege, buddy. All right, please don't interrupt me during a talk. Please don't interrupt me during a talk. Um, I mean, you, can you get a goon or something? I mean, it's like quiet for a minute, please. And I'm plenty happy to argue with you when this is over. Um, so yeah, the we're gonna go up to our solution and how you use it, right? So how to interface, and I mean. So this talk right, really is about providing an interface or, or a framework for interfacing with connected vehicles um, using Linux. So right, it's never been easier, right? Just use Linux. Um, uh, we modify the Linux networking subsystems, MAC 802.11, CFG 802.11 um, to support 802.11p and then uh, developed, uh, 60, developed a kernel driver which, we're, which is being integrated into the mainline kernel for the, all the 1609 um, you know, data elements and, and, and members such that you'll be able to use a J2735 networking utility much like IW which we provide to dispatch um, DSRC messages from the standard Linux wireless interface. Uh, where we start is, so bottom of the stack, modify the regulatory domain add definitions for the intelligent transportation systems channels to the uh, Atheros wireless drivers or, you know, to the, to the arbitrary wireless driver. Right now, um, while it's built into the mainline Linux kernel, uh, manufacturers of hardware specify a specific regulatory domain that hardware can operate in. So you have to make a few slight modifications to each wireless driver, um, which are rather analogous uh, and, and, and pretty much equivalent. We, it, it looks the same in the RTL um, and will release support for a wide set of standard drivers. Um, you modify the regulatory domain in the kernel and in the user space utilities, so in the net wireless interface and also uh, in the CRDA and wireless regdb at the uh, at the user space layer, and then uh, modify the regulatory domain of the wireless driver as shown in the second picture there. Uh, and then you just you define uh, the filtering mechanisms for the 8211p frames. So you, you know, there's, uh, it, it is defined that 8211p frames that are compatible are data, QS, and action, and specifically the types that are listed here. And you just enforce the use of multicast addressing. So all messages that are, are um, transmitted from 8211p need use this um, broadcast BSSID, wildcard BSSID, um, six octets of all Fs. And then in order to implement this in user space, you, we made some simple modifications to the IW utility, which I'm sure everyone here who's used Linux is quite familiar with. Um, you add a definition to, uh, to join and leave uh, the OCB channels. You add compatibility for 5 and 10 megahertz with subcarriers within the channels. You, uh, and then you can run this command, um, which we'll provide an example of in our GitHub repo, to, I mean, it's the that command right up there, and the result is that you're able to successfully join a uh, 5 gigahertz channel in OCB mode using exclusive use of the channel uh, and 10 megahertz subcarrier. So this is 8211p implemented. Next, we're going to talk about implementing WAVE. Okay.
so the uh, implementation of Wave is mostly to do with the actual um, messaging coding all the way up from the, the, the short message and you know the constituent fields in there, and um, and that's primarily to do with actually just making really big parsers or really big parser and a really big encoder and um, encoder and decoder to actually allow you to turn these structures into a byte stream that goes and inject it into the wireless interface to go over the air. Um, <clears throat> and then along with that, there's also the channel switching capabilities that need to be done to switch between the service and the control channel, uh, which are handled through IW, uh, just dispatching a IW set chan, right? Um, and then some user space links that allow you to use stuff like uh, PCAP inject to just send it off to the wireless interface directly and handle it all in user space and not worry about any kernel messiness. Still you. Um, oh. Let's go up to the structs real quick. Okay, so here is the uh, wave short message struct. I mean, this is a pretty simple definition, right? So you have subtype, version, TPID. Um, you know, then we have the uh, end header information element extension. Um, which is just a block of uh, extra information regarding like things like location um, and heading or, or RF, RF uh, information like transmission power, data rate, that kind of thing. Moving on is the actual information element block which contains these optional fields for the RF parameters, um, the routing, you know, external DNSs and various services that are provided potentially by the actual peer. And here are the, the sort of ancillary structs that are filled in there. Uh, we got the routing advertisement, service advertisements, and then the channel information and service information. I mean, these are all just, uh, they encode the, I mean, more particular information for the advanced functions provided in the higher, label, higher layer services that are built on top of this. Um, yeah. Um, so then J2735 is, is uh, and now it's really easy to implement, so we, we pulled some, some specification from the, from the broken ASN1 file as J2735 provided. Um, so we, here's the struct, say, for one of the messages, the basic safety message, which is one that most compatibility has been added for. Um, we fill each of the fields up with data elements that are within the, the, ra the accepted range as specified by the standard. And then we take uh, one of the structs that Nick just described. We fill it up with uh, data and pack the basic safety message just into the, uh, into the data field. Serialize it using uh, an encoding function that we wrote. Um, and then dispatch it to the wireless interface using PCAP inject. And we can see uh, when we pull it up in Wireshark, it recognizes that a wave short message was transmitted. Um, the Wireshark plugin for 1609 is incomplete. Um, and and doesn't recognize uh, all the all the types of packets and stuff yet, but uh, we provide you know means to to do this to do testing uh, and injection. What you can see here is that we have successfully using a, a nine uh, Atheris nine K twenty dollar Wi-Fi card injected a uh, DSRC message into the VANet spectrum. Um, and the same thing you can do with other kinds of safety messages, emergency vehicle alerts, and roadside advertisements. These are just simple examples of the same thing. Uh, and they're just as easy to transmit and inject. Um, and then when you examine right, the, the capture from Wireshark, you see all the data is there with all the proper padding. I'll, I mean, uh, it's not really going to be too easy to see here. But um, so what can you do with this, right? Uh, what we have described so far is a means to as we said, transmit and inject into the into the, the the wave spectrum, the intelligent transportation channels to interface with the VA net. Um, so you want to be a master? See if you can pwn like these. These are five five sort of levels of increasing um, complexity. You can form denial of service um, on say single antenna. Well, you can perform denial of service on the PKI infrastructure. Uh, the example here we give is on single antenna uh, systems where you can actually cause a collision attack by transmitting out of sync with the rest of the uh, nearby network. Um, <clears throat> on top of that, there are, uh, I mean, so you, you can enumerate over, so uh, the actual nature of the, of the network is such that you can enumerate over the actual services provided just by observing the traffic across and that allows you to characterize a great number of the 
uh, architectures in the cars that are along the road. And if you can get information about the architecture specific stuff, uh, the implementation specific stuff on the car, you can actually fingerprint that and say that, oh wow, you know, this car is running something that I know is vulnerable and I want to inject and mess with it in some particular way. You can, as we described earlier, um, uh, hijack uh, or uh, perform pri privilege escalation in the public, inf in public key infrastructure to hijack a certificate for an emergency vehicle or some other kind of privileged user that's allowed to execute built-in services like Bluetooth, which drives, which makes a vehicle come to a stop on the side of the roadway, or um, uh, you know, it's, et cetera. And if, if anyone would, would ever want to do that, right? Um, you can also become a mobile toll booth. Sure. I mean, if, if the, you know, the compromise, it requires, you know, the exploitation of these privileged users to actually gain access to their certificate. And if you're able to do that, you can swipe their privileges and actually start masquerading around along the road and, and do things you're not supposed to, right? So, I mean, that, that's, the, that's the idea in terms of, of these uh, exploits. Or, you know, not exploits, but these particular um, attack vectors. Yep, yep. Um. So, and there's, there's um, you know, this also introduces other types of, of pwning and potential for exploitation of, of vulnerabilities that exist today. Um, right, you can easily, uh, you know, the point about having, you know, network access from one single entry point and being able to propagate a message up means you can propagate things like malware across the entire network from one, from one entry point. And moreover, if an entry point has a vulnerability that is implementation specific, not even one that exists a theoretical basis in the standards, that provides you the ability to compromise all other systems that are compliant, that might not, ha not harbor the same vulnerability. Um, you can reverse, uh, reverse engineer wirelessly now, reverse engineer, engineer vehicular architectures um, the same way that you would reverse engineer, say, a vehicle control bus by performing enumeration of built in diagnostic services in the DSRC uh, protocol. You uh, can uh, let's see. You want to talk about that? I mean, <clears throat> uh, so I mean, some of the nature or the nature of this uh, of the the vehicular ad hoc network and Vita X particularly is that these these um, vehicles communicate to each other, right? But the vehicle also bridges out to external networks, be it through uh, Wi-Fi access points or LTE. So if the vehicle is able to be compromised by messages going across DSRC, then you can actually use that, you know, LTE, the, the card, you know, the um, cell phone chip on the, on the car to actually pipe data up to wherever you want um, and potentially even, you know, get data, data back down and, you know, plug in back doors, whatever the hell you want. Uh, I mean, that's the idea. Yep. And even more than poning, uh, the whole point of this, while it is, it is neat to showcase, right, these are these, uh, these kinds of attacks. It's more about providing a platform that allows everyone homogeneously to, to participate in the development of these standards and of these future architectures. Um, the state of them today is very much reflects the need for participation by the security community to, to develop these to a point where they are resilient and robust and ready for deployment in safety critical infrastructure systems that are going to involve more network traffic than we've ever seen before in this kind of system. Um, so you get to participate. This code, uh, we've released our framework on GitHub and we're going to continue development and contribution to it um, to extend support to a wide range of wireless drivers and to, uh, to f um, continue developing uh, the J2735 interface as the standards become developed further uh, and eventually integrate 1609 when the full family is complete and ready. So. Um, we, unfortunately, we don't have more time to do. We'll, we'll be doing some stuff over in the Kraken Village. You can come and ask us questions, and we can show you stuff. Um, I want to thank these guys, especially especially that one there in the middle, for helping us get through this um, over the last couple of years. So here's the GitHub link. Here's some references, and thank you very much.